Okay, this video is about um, mTOR. What can be done to slow down mTOR and in so doing, slow down the growth of cancer, slow down aging, increased lifespan. This slide right here is a summary of it. Basically, what you want once you're an adult is to stay in maintenance, especially once you're middle-aged and older. So maintenance means you keep yourself healthy but you don't want abnormal cell proliferation. There's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is what's called the Hayflick limit. If you accelerate the rate at which cells divide, it means you die sooner. Um, the Hayflick limit means that somatic body cells, that's not from the germline, so not your sperm and your ovary egg cells, they can only divide about 60 times. And Hayflick was the microbiologist who discovered this. And then they go into sort of senescence aging and they just die. Okay, so basically, you want to slow down aging. And the way you do it is by slowing down mTOR. mTOR is a nutrient sensing pathway. We'll go into much more detail in a moment and I'll show you pictures of it. But basically when there's tons of protein and fat available, it tells the cell to grow and divide. Uh, so you want to slow down mTOR. So the things that will slow down mTOR, we're gonna explain the reason for all of these in just a moment, but to summarize it, exercise, it increases this AMPK pathway. Um, complex carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, starches, that's all your friend. Staying thin, getting your sleep, social relationships, purpose, religion, gratitude, all of that stuff keeps you in a low stress, low cortisol, healthy um, phase and you don't get abnormal growth. Okay, now here's what you don't want. When you're fat, that causes hyperlipidemia and problems. Lack of sleep, insomnia, caffeine, etc. Uh, will lead to increased cortisol level, leads to obesity, immune suppression, and insulin resistance and problems. Activation of mTOR, which is primarily by dietary fat and by dietary protein, especially, by far, especially animal protein. Animal protein is unique. It's got a different amino acid composition than does plant protein. Animal protein has a lot more leucine in particular. That's the most powerful activator of mTOR. Lysine and methionine. Arginine also activates mTOR, but that's not a big deal. That's not even an essential amino acid. Okay, but leucine, lysine, and methionine, those are your essential amino acids um, from meat, okay? <laughs> meat, meat's just like the biggest cancer promoter. It's so bad. You, the more you study it, the more you'll, you'll notice that. You know, what is meat? It's basically animal protein and fat. <laughs> Both of those things activate mTOR. Um, whenever you have insulin resistance, especially, let's say, dietary fat, but animal protein also... And there's other things that will activate insulin. You know, excess dietary sodium will cause insulin resistance. We talked about excess stress, excess insomnia, excess caffeine. They'll all lead to insulin resistance, increase insulin, and increase uh, insulin-like growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor and insulin both activate mTOR. mTOR <clears throat> increases cell growth and cell proliferation. Sedentary lifestyle. Excessive sweets. Excessive sweets can lead to, you know, fatty liver and push you down that cascade. Excessive exposure to estrogenic chemicals. Okay, so now we'll start looking at some of the details here. So here's a picture of mTOR. It's a complex of proteins, and basically here's the things that activate it. In particular, um, growth factors like insulin itself is a growth factor. It's anabolic. Uh, Insulin-like growth factor, which is always increased when insulin is increased. Um, those are things that will get mTOR activated. And amino acids, in particular the stuff from meat. Lysine, leucine, methionine, okay? Um, what does it do? It tells the cell to grow and proliferate. This is from this uh, journal here, Journal of Biological Chemistry here. mTOR starts doing other things you don't want, pushing you into this growth replication pathway, more glucose being taken into the cell, increased glucose transporters on the cell membrane, potentially even in cancer, certainly, you get a shift to hexokinase 2 instead of hexokinase 1, at the beginning of the glycolysis. We talked about it in separate lectures. Um, here's a basic concept of cancer that cancer cells tend to have a doubling time relatively fixed. And let's say on average it's about 100 days. So to go from one cell to two cells takes 100 days. From two cells to four cells, another 100 days. And so what you want to do, let's say you have cancer. And many of us, we've got cancer inside our bodies. We just don't know it. It's too small to diagnose. Everybody pretty much does because they've got mutated cells, they've been exposed to carcinogenic chemicals. The key is keep yourself healthy so it never grows. Big deal. You don't want to know about all these uh, slow-growing cancer cells in your body. Just keep yourself healthy, keep your immune system functioning well, and they're very, very unlikely to give you any problems. 
Okay, another point. This is from uh, one of Dr. McDougall's lectures based on this article in the Journal of Surgical Oncology. By the time you can diagnose cancer, it's usually about a centimeter in diameter, you know, 10 millimeters. And it's usually before that point metastatic. So those are called micrometastases, meaning that they're present, but no one can see them. And it's usually the metastases in like 90% or more of the patients that actually kills the patient. So the real battle to survive cancer is to control metastatic disease and prevent it and minimize its growth. Um, so we'll talk about that in a moment more. Okay, here's pretty much the, the map of cancer. Initiation is the initial injury to a cell that damages mitochondria. The somatic mutation theory emphasizes mutagenic chemicals and viruses. The uh, metabolic theory of cancer, MTC, emphasizes hypoxia and the Warburg effect, Warburg effect, where the cancer cell essentially has an injured mitochondria, so it can no longer do aerobic metabolism, and it switches to anaerobic metabolism primarily. That's called the Warburg effect. And that is tumor initiation. So that's the initial mutation or mitochondrial injury that now that cell is abnormal and it has a lot of emphasis on glycolysis for growth and switching to a you know, more biosynthesis rather than doing the work of the organ system it's a part of. Okay, now here's the money. Here's the most important thing for you to know on this slide. The game to survive cancer is won or lost in this promotion phase. So T. Colin Campbell's masterpiece book, The China Study, talks about animal protein, you don't want it, not one bite. Because it's just a major, it's the most powerful cancer promoter of anything in the whole world, more than all those cancer chemicals and all those viruses. Okay, his entire book, China Study, is about that, and he talks about it extensively in his other books, in The Whole, and The Future of Nutrition, et cetera, and all his lectures on the, on the internet. Okay, what else is a tumor promoter? Estrogenic chemicals promote, you know, estrogenic sensitive uh, uh, tissues, for example, the breast, the male prostate, the uterus lining, you know, the endometrium. Um, iron is needed for cancer growth. Increased insulin promotes cancer. What causes increased insulin? High fat diet. When insulin is increased, it automatically increases insulin like growth factor. Uh, protein will also increase insulin like growth factor. And these will increase mTOR. mTOR will, it's like the conductor says, okay, I got it. It's like a building contractor. mTOR, it's like a building contractor says, I got everything I need now. Time to build. Time to replicate this cell. Okay, immunosuppression also increases the, the risk of cancer spread. You need your immune system to suppress cancer. Uh, a, a cancer as small as one centimeter, like the top of my thumb, will routinely spread, release into the blood like a million or more cells per day of cancer cells. Your immune system just plucks them all out or they die. They can never establish... Uh, growth in a distant location, but the point is you need a good immune system. You want a good immune system, all right? Um, ongoing hypoxia and all that stuff. Okay, invasion mets, all right. We'll, we'll not talk about that for today. I've talked about that in other lectures, but the bottom line is if you're preventing tumor promotion, you're also preventing growth of metastases. Okay, this is just a slide where I talk about some of the history of some of the great leaders in nutrition research and cancer. And the bottom line, though, is like I get this from T. Colin Campbell, and I confirmed it from reading elsewhere. Most important thing is avoid tumor promoters. The tumor promoters are much, much, much more important than the carcinogens. Everybody hears about such and such a chemical is carcinogenic, such and such a chemical is carcinogenic. If you damage a cell but it doesn't grow, it can't hurt you. What hurts you is when the cancer starts growing out of control. What does cancer need to grow out of control? It needs tumor promoters. And it's easy to avoid these tumor promoters. It's hard to avoid all these carcinogenic chemicals. You can't do it. But you can easily avoid tumor promoters. Zero animal food. Zero. None. No meat, not one bite, no dairy, not one drop, one sip, none of it. Uh, no oils. Those are tumor promoters as well. Okay, here's a little bit more about mTOR and how it works. This is actually uh, three slides. They're all really three pictures. They're all from this article here. Uh, 25 years of mTOR, uncovering the links from nutrients to growth. Here's the author, uh, David Sabatini. You know, he's a very good scientist. He's got a bunch of lectures online about, you know, he was one of the main scientists. This guy might win a Nobel Prize someday who discovered and figured out the mTOR pathway. Okay, so what does mTOR mean? It means mammalian target of rapamycin. Okay, where does that all come from? Um, the M can mean mammalian, and it can also mean mechanistic, you know, the mechanism pathway, target of rapamycin. So rapamycin is an, really an antibiotic, and it was discovered 
from a soil bacteria on an island called Rapa Nui. And Rapa Nui, the island, is also called Easter Island, the one with those big head statues of heads. So some scientists isolated rapamycin from a soil bacteria on Easter Island, Rapa Nui Island, and they wanted an antifungal. They found out it actually does some other things that you may or may not want, um, but it did have some anti-cancer anti properties and it inhibited this growth pathway. So then the question is, well, what activates the growth pathway? We just talked about that. Increased leucine in particular, this amino acid, increased methionine. Two amino acids, much more common in meat than in plant foods. So when you eat a plant-based diet, you're probably going to be relatively low in leucine, low in methionine. If you eat a meat diet, you're going to be high in those things, more activation of mTOR. Plus, fat causes insulin resistance. Insulin resistance causes increased insulin-like growth factor. Insulin and insulin-like growth factor, they both activate mTOR. So that's bad. That's one of the reasons why you're going to see all this promotion of high-fat diets. I think it's bogus. Okay, What I think is happening is there's you know millions of acres of of land sort of in a sense being wasted on all these uh cattle and all that land could be freed up if the population could be switched to eating a plant-based diet and it's better for the environment too so there's a push to switch the population to a plant-based diet but i think the corporations don't want the people to help be healthy because they want them to eat high fat because all there's big money in high fat look at it. you know everybody's promoting nuts and olive oil and all these other omega-3 oils and seeds and all this stuff I don't believe it. I don't think, I'm not aware of anything good about eating fat. <laughs> um, so they go into fat, that's a topic for another day, dietary lipids. But I'm just telling you, that's where I see things at. And the reason I don't like it is these fats cause insulin resistance. Insulin resistance increases insulin. Automatically, you'll increase insulin-like growth factor. When insulin is increased, it increases insulin-like growth factor because insulin blocks the synthesis of something called insulin-like growth factor binding protein, which ties up the ILGF in the blood. So once insulin is elevated, then you're going to have um, decreased binding protein for the ILGF, and ILGF will be elevated too. So you're just automatically eating it. Whenever you're eating these fat diets, and it's not just saturated fats, the other fats too, you're causing insulin resistance, and you're subsequently going to be increasing mTOR. You don't want to do that. Um, okay, now here's a question. Now this, is a, this extra picture over here shows here's the amino acid leucine, and it'll form hydrogen bonds with the binding site pocket, so to speak, on mTOR. mTOR is this big protein complex, and it senses a lot of things, and it's got a little pocket for sensing leucine. Leucine is the most important amino acid to activate it. And so be aware of that. So what I'm saying is you want to minimize your dietary intake of leucine. Okay? And it's definitely obvious. Go zero on animal protein, not another bite of animal protein the rest of your life. That is obvious. But should you reduce your intake of dietary proteins? Now, if you listen to T. Colin Campbell, he'll tell you, hold on a sec, he tested soy protein and gluten protein, and you could feed, as soon as you feed an animal, you know, 10% or more animal protein, perhaps even 5% or more, you're increasing cancer risk. But uh, with soy and gluten, he could feed the animals just 20% gluten protein, 20% soy protein, and that did not increase cancer. However, here's my opinion. In real life, people don't eat just one type of protein. They'll eat several different types. Like let's say they're having beans and grains. And what I'm saying is that could add up pretty fast. And so that's why I think it probably a good idea to lower your overall animal pro your overall protein intake. Now there's a little controversy about that because a lot of people tell you, including Dan Butner with uh, National Geographic and all his centenarian populations, those so-called he calls them the blue zones, they tended to all eat a cup of beans per day. Should you, you know, should you maybe limit it to a cup, not two cups or three cups? Uh, should you eat beans at all? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I'm kind of wondering about it. But you know, there's also a guy. I think his name is James Mitchell, PhD. He's got a great lecture about totally reducing dietary protein as a way to increase longevity. Um, he's got internet. It's on like the Buchinger Wilhelm Buchinger Clinic uh, lecture. I'll talk about that in the future some other time, but. Okay, here's another thing about why you're so screwed <clears throat> with dietary fat and with um, uh, insulin resistance because you end up in a vicious circle. And what I mean by that is when you increase mTOR, mTOR has a feedback mechanism to cause more insulin resistance. So it promotes insulin resistance. So you see how you're screwed? You eat all the fat, you get insulin resistance, you increase mTOR, mTOR signals back, 
causes more insulin resistance. You're not going to win that game. You, there's, and I think it comes down to our metabolism simply is not made for high fat, high animal protein diets. It's just not. And I, by the way, I don't think there's any controversy about nutrition. I think all this stuff about keto, low carb, carnivore diets, it's all nonsense, okay? And I'll also tell you, this guy, David Sabatini, you know, I think he's one of the great scientists and just figuring out this pathway. So I think he's brilliant, genius level at all his science. But when it comes to nutrition, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And that's typical, by the way. You can get this one of the smartest doctors you'll find in their field or scientists. And typically when it comes to nutrition, they're, they're idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so he doesn't know what he's talking about nutrition. I saw him talking about nutrition, you know. He says he drinks coffee and stuff. And it's like... Okay, you know, you've analyzed mTOR out the wazoo, every detail of it, you know, brilliant, awesome science, but you obviously haven't studied nutrition. So that's a other subject, okay? Uh, but by the way, his lectures, I thought his lectures were quite good on mTOR. I was impressed by them. I enjoyed them. Um, so mTOR causes insulin resistance, but here's the thing. Vicious cycle. You're screwed. You're just going to keep cycling back. Insulin resistance, more mTOR, insulin resistance, more mTOR, insulin resistance, mTOR, screwed. And then when you're when you're increasing mTOR, you're accelerating the rate of cell growth. So you're going to reach the hay flick limit, 60 cell divisions, before the cells go into senescence and then die. So why would you want to do that? It's stupid. Okay, mTOR and cancer, like we said, mTOR is like a nutrient sensing pathway, like a building contractor, weight slow, it's ready to build. Here's a guy, Sabatini, who got really good uh, lectures online on mTOR. There's other good lectures. There's another guy by name. I think his name is Dr. Hall, and he's at, at iBiology. He's got a good lecture about mTOR as well. There's other lectures on mTOR, but, you know, I don't really like college and medical school level lectures because those are usually just, you know, preparation for a standardized test, memorizing a whole bunch of minutia, and they don't even really know what they're talking about. Sabatini knows what he's talking about. The other PhD Hall, who's a researcher on mTOR, they know what they're talking about. Um, they still go into more research minutia than you want. I'm giving you what I think is useful to you without all the details, okay? Because there's always more details in biology. Um, excess activation of mTOR causes accelerated cell growth and replication, like we said. That's a no-no. Speeds up your aging because you arrive at the Hayflick limit sooner, then you're screwed, run out of time, dead, uh, can accelerate cell replication and cancer, bad, you die sooner. If you speed up cancer's replication, you're speeding up the doubly time, you die sooner. I mean, basically my strategy if I had cancer, known cancer, would be to slow it down as much as possible. So, you know, cancer usually takes, it varies, but let's say it takes anywhere from 20 to 30 years to kill you based on from when it was, you know, started, so to speak, before you could detect it. And if you just double it's it's uh, doubling time. You'll die 60 years later. Who cares? You know, so you got it at 40, and you die at 100. All right. If you can, if you can slow it down from killing you in 30 years to killing you in 60 years. Okay. What activates mTOR? So we talked about the amino acids in meat, leucine, methionine, and lysine. That's why you should never eat meat. It's totally screwed, and it's full of fat, causing insulin resistance. Increase in insulin. That's uh, mitogenic. Increase in mTOR, which will increase uh, insulin-like growth factor. And that's also uh, mitogenic and pushes you to cancer. Okay, so what you want is how do you decrease mTOR? Caloric restriction. Now, nobody wants to starve themselves, but all you have to do is switch to a plant-based diet. You're going to be skinnier, and you'll eat a net fewer calories because the starch satisfies your hunger with a lot fewer calories than all these high caloric density animal foods. Um, I think decreasing dietary protein. If I, had, if I had a clinically diagnosed cancer, would I decrease dietary protein? Yes, I would. Um, it just seems to me from my reading that that would be a smart thing to do because I want to decrease my net amount of leucine. Not just, you know, yeah, I'll avoid animal food, of course, but I would also decrease my net amount of protein. There just isn't going to be much leucine around in my body if I ever had cancer. Um, what else? I would also minimize my dietary fat, all types of dietary fat. You get more than enough. It's impossible on any type of diet that you could pick out your foods. It's impossible to be too low in protein. I give him multiple separate lectures on diet and protein. It's impossible to be too low in fat. You cannot eat your plant foods and end up being too low in fat. So forget about it. all this stuff about good fats. It's nonsense. All right, exercise more. You want to activate what's called the AMP pathway. So AMP stands for adenosine monophosphate. And that means the cell's low in energy. So it's an, it's an adenosine with one phosphate, monophosphate, as opposed to being ATP, adenosine, that would be a triphosphate, and that's a high energy. That's the $20 bill of the cell for energy. And what AMPK pathway really means is AMP 
activated protein kinase pathway, okay? And that is good because it turns off mTOR. So basically, after you exercise, your cells are a little bit low in their energy phase. And so they tell mTOR, hey, now is not a good time to, to divide. We're kind of tired. We just got to, you know, do our maintenance, all right? So it also, of course, gets your lymphatics flowing, gets your WBC circulating through your lymphatics, compresses them with their valve system to improve uh, WBC removal of cancer cells from your body. Okay, so now we come back to the summary slide. I actually got two more slides after this that are going to be really fast, but all these things that cause cell proliferation are bad. They accelerate aging, they accelerate cancer growth. So you don't want insomnia because it elevates cortisol, but caffeine elevates cortisol, sleep deprivation elevates cortisol, cortisol medications <laughs> elevate cortisol, excessive stress elevates cortisol. You don't want to be fat because fat causes hyperlipidemia in the blood, um, and it's associated with increased estrogen production with the, with the aromatase enzyme in your adipose tissue. You don't want elevation of mTOR, which of course we talked about is increased by animal protein, especially protein in general, and also by excess dietary fat. And they cause insulin resistance, increase insulin, and increase insulin-like growth factor, which increase mTOR. Um, estrogenic chemicals will promote growth, like in the breast, uterus, and prostate. Um, there's tons of estrogenic chemicals. That's a topic for another day. I've got previous video lectures on that. Sedentary. Now you want to get exercising because it'll elevate the AMPK pathway and it'll decrease insulin resistance. Excess dietary sodium. Most people don't know that, but excess dietary sodium also will increase insulin resistance and thus increase insulin, insulin-like growth factor, increase mTOR, etc. Excess dietary sodium is not something you don't want. That excess, excess dietary sweets. You know, in large amounts, excess dietary sweets. Some of the excess fat, especially the fructose, gets converted to fat in the liver, can push you towards a fatty liver. So like the stupidest thing is to drink um, these really sweetened beverages. Those are just worthless, bad for your health. Okay, we talked about what's good for you. Complex carbohydrates. Well, gee, it's eat plant foods. Your starches, your fruits and vegetables. Um, get your sleep. Maintain support, social support, love and relationships to the extent you can. <clears throat> Have a purpose in life. Religion helps people a lot. Attitude of gratitude. Because those things all lower your stress level. When they lower your stress level, they lower your cortisol. So they increase your insulin sensitivity. Um, they make you more resilient. They improve your immune system function. Religious people live longer. People with a strong sense of purpose, they can handle setbacks and disappointments because they have a sense of destiny. And a little setback, they know it's always going to be two steps up, one step back, two steps up, one step back. And they're strong in that way. You know? Okay, here's just a couple papers. We'll briefly just mention them. We're not going to go into any detail on these, but just so you know about them. There's a whole bunch of papers showing high-fat diets increase survival in people with cancer. There's tons of patients who've survived advanced cancer and have got incredibly good outcomes and long-term survival. And the, the, the medical journals will just publish spontaneous regression, spontaneous regression. And the vast majority of them don't ever get published. But the ones that do... They usually don't go into all the details about what the patient did. But then when people started interviewing them, like Kelly Turner and whatnot, you talk to these patients, and other people have had the same experience from talking to them. They did lots of stuff. And typically it's they ate a plant-based diet. The closer to low-fat vegan, the better. And they exercised a lot, and they lowered their stress, and they many of them had religion, and they maintained their social supports, let go of their resentments, had an attitude of gratitude, all that stuff. So it's all part of optimizing your immune system function and your attitude and making yourself more resilient. Okay, just another paper on leucine and it's leucine increases diabetes too. Animal protein is a screw job. It you know increases your diabetes, increases your cancer, accelerates your aging. It's all bad. Okay, um, this is just the exercise activating the AMP pathway pathway which then turns off mTOR. Um, so anyways, hope that was helpful.